It was a one-two punch from China's President Xi and his new foreign minister aimed squarely at the United States. On Monday, Xi accused Western countries led by the United States of containing and suppressing China. He said those actions had severely challenged Beijing, and he called on the country to unite as one to fight back. It was a rare case of China's top leader calling out the United States directly. The next day, Xi's top diplomat warned that conflict and confrontation will be the result if Washington doesn't change its tactics. It's safe to say we are in a very dangerous moment in U.S.-China relations. Kevin Rudd is here to help us understand. He's a former prime minister of Australia who has led the Asia Society for two years, but is about to become Australia's ambassador to the U.S. He is the author of a terrific book, The Avoidable War. Kevin, welcome. Good to be with you on the program, Fareed. So when you hear Xi Jinping say what he did and his foreign minister say what he, what, what he did, uh, this is a big change for the Chinese, who have ten tended to not, not refer to the United States by name, specifically accuse it in the way they did. What's going on? I must admit, as someone who's looked at this for the last 40 years, I was surprised. Um, it's probably not since the 90s since I've seen a Chinese paramount leader attack the United States by name. They usually have a, an expression which says such and such a country certain or certain nations, countries. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that uh, diplomacy was pushed to one side. And then, of course, the foreign minister went one step further by saying if the United States continues its current posture, in particular on Taiwan, inevitably this will result in conflict. I've never heard that from a Chinese foreign minister before. So I think two things are at play here. I think uh, both uh, Xi Jinping and his team are under considerable domestic economic pressure at present from a very slow economy. And this has been an opportunity for Xi Jinping to say, we know you're going through a hard time domestically, growth's been down, unemployment's been up, prices are a problem in certain areas, but the United States and its allies have been making life impossible for us by the pressure they've brought to bear on us domestically. So I think that's one of the rationales. But, you know, when a Chinese president says something as definitive as this, it also has its own intrinsic foreign security policy significance. And I do believe it further accelerates China's preparedness militarily uh, for a future action over Taiwan, if and when Xi Jinping so chooses. So how did we get here? If one were to, if, if Rip Van Winkle were to have gone to sleep when Obama was having that meeting in sunny lands mm. with Xi Jinping and they take their jackets off and they walk together, it seemed like, yes, a complicated relationship. Some of the stuff they were talking about was China's economic espionage mm. and U.S. support for Taiwan, but manageable. And from there, we're now at what seems like the beginning of a new Cold War. How, what happened? I think two or three things, Fareed. Um, the first is the balance of power between these two countries has really changed again over the last 10 years. China was becoming more powerful, but the acceleration of the gap, um, or should I say the narrowing of the gap uh, between China and the US in military capabilities, but also in aggregate economic size has actually caused China to conclude um, it has an ability now to project its own interests and values in a way in which it didn't see as possible before. The second big change driver, I think, is Xi Jinping himself. I mean, the dynamic of Xi's leadership is a, a change driver in itself. Ideologically, he's a Marxist-Leninist. He's a much more uh, dedicated uh, advocate of an assertive foreign and security policy. And you see him pushing the trajectory and accelerating the velocity of China's shall we say, moment in the global sun. And then third, the United States has pushed back. That was, I wanted to ask you about that, because the other big shift that took place since then was the election of Donald Trump mm. uh, and a much, much uh, tougher uh, foreign policy, first economically, then. Um, what do you think happened? You, watching it from the outside, as it were, as an Australian, what strikes you about why and how did America change? Well, if you look at late-term uh, Obama, there were already some changes. Remember, President Obama was uh, responsible for the pivot to Asia. Um, remember, President Obama initiated the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which, if you like, was a way of bringing the free economies of Asia together uh, under American leadership, dealing with the emerging 
economic monolith, which was China. But you're right, things did radically change under Donald Trump. Um, the reasons for it, I think, driven essentially in the first instance by the view of the Trump administration on trade, that this was a net loser for the United States, that jobs had been sacrificed, and they galvanized a series of reservations already alive in the American debate, uh, which caused um, the launching of um, the trade war of 2018-19. Then, of course, the turbocharging influence of COVID and the Wuhan origins and where that took the relationship. So that uh, then you had the formal proclamation of a new doctrine of strategic competition by the then National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster. So this was a rapid transition during Trump, but the beginnings of it lay in late Obama. So next on GPS, questions swirl about whether China might supply arms to Russia for its war in Ukraine. If that happened, it would change the course of the war and perhaps of world order. I will ask Kevin Rudd whether he thinks it will happen when we come back. And we are back here on GPS talking about relations between Beijing and Washington with Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia, soon to become Canberra's ambassador to Washington. So, Kevin, help us understand China's calculation with regard to Ukraine. Does it help China to have Russia in this war? I mean, it feels like it's a, it's a, the war is not going particularly well for Russia, but how does China view this war? You know, often looking from the outside, we think, what's in this for China? Um, China's at risk of shredding uh, its international reputation by being too close uh, to um, Putin's uh, invasion of Ukraine, not it's sufficiently independent, etc. If you look at this uh, relationship, however, uh, through the Beijing lens or through the Xi Jinping lens, it's really important to see this. From his strategic view, having Russia on side with China for the long term is of fundamental importance. For most of their 400 year history, as you know, as a student of this, it's been a heavily armed border. You no longer have to do that. There's no longer 18 Soviet divisions on the other side of the, the border. China can focus all of its military activity and resources and planning to the maritime theater, its principal future adversary, the United States. I think the other thing in Xi Jinping's calculus is the Russians from time to time will provide rolling strategic distractions for the United States in other theaters. Syria, some time ago, now of course in Ukraine. Again, uh, causing the United States to be f focusing in multiple directions at once. China has one direction to focus on. And, and wouldn't you add, I mean, it also gives China, Russia as a kind of junior partner, some would say a vassal state. That is, we forget, the, one of the world's largest producers of energy, oil, coal, natural okay. gas, and China needs that desperately. Absolutely. It provides secure access, reliable access, and cheap prices, discounted <laughs> prices, uh, free steak knives thrown in, uh, in order to have access to Russia's oil, gas, but also agricultural commodities um, where they are available and applicable. So you put that mix together. From Xi's perspective, oh, I don't want to do anything, he would say in his own mind, to jeopardize that. Furthermore, the last thing he could ever see from his own interest point of view, would be to sit back and see Putin fail fundamentally, uh, let alone a Putin collapse in Russia itself. So will China supply arms to Russia? There's the $6,000 question. I've read carefully what the United States administration have said now through multiple officials, um, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, etc., about and the director of the CIA, uh, about um, real intelligence on these matters. Uh, if you read carefully the text, decisions have not yet been taken. What's my gut? Um, in terms of where China is at present, unless they were, to con were concluding internally that there was a danger of Putin actually losing and actually coming under massive pressure in terms of his own position back home, I do not see that it is in China's interest now to cross that line. Um, either directly through providing uh, military materiel directly to the Russians or cleverly through third parties, as is often been suggested. You know, you, at the end of your book, which is really uh, terrific, um, you talk about the need for managed strategic competition between the United States and China. 
Um, it seems we're far from that right now. Mm. We seem to be going into a world where China is going to quadruple its nuclear arsenal, where we, we will essentially be in a new nuclear age, which could be quite unstable with very little, by the way, of arms control talks and treaties. What would you advise Washington to do to, to bring things back on track? If we were to have, I think, Chancellor Schultz here or President Macron, or we were to have uh, President Yoon in Korea or Prime Minister Kishida in Japan, um, I think the general view would be to the superpowers, uh, both these superpowers, uh, finding a mechanism to restabilize the relationship, new strategic guardrails to reduce the risk of crisis, conflict and war by accident. And if they're looking for a precedent, and you're a student of international relations history, Remember after the near-death experience of the Cuban Missile Crisis? The Soviets and the United States for the subsequent 30 years never ever got close to the abyss again. They developed a series of common protocols, including the Helsinki Accords in 1975. So I think there is a view across many countries that taking this temperature down is in the world's interest, it's in allies' interests, and it's also in the interests of China's closest friends and partners as well. Is it in order to try to help move things along those, those lines that you've decided to take this new job? You are a former prime minister. You have a terrific job. You could travel the world. Why, why, is that why you're doing this? No, it's the climate in Washington. I just, I just love the sunshine. The, um, the, uh, no, my, my prime minister, who um, has been a friend and colleague for years in Australian politics, asked me, and so did the foreign minister, but I think their interest like mine and their anxiety like mine is this is be starting to become dangerous. And um, Australia is uh, one of America's oldest treaty allies. Uh, we've been in the trenches with the United States in uh, I think all of America's major wars in the 20th century and into the 21st century, even some of the crazy ones. <laughs> and so um, working closely with the administration and the guidance of the government in Canberra is about dealing with the granularity of deterrence, dealing with the granularity of um, mechanisms to reduce the risk of crisis, conflict and war by accident, as well as uh, the roles and responsibility of allies. Um, so. Uh, of course, as an ambassador, I'm promoting the Australian national interests in business and security and defence and all that, and I'll be doing that happily as well. But I think we're living in dangerous times, my friend, uh, really dangerous times, and I think it's time for all hands to the pump. Well, I'm delighted to have you on, Kevin. I'm also delighted because my guess is that th this being your exit interview from now on, you'll be you'll be speaking in diplomatic banalities, and I will not get something this uh, interesting <laughs> out of you. Thank you.